Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is my quarantine hair. Welcome to the second lecture of the summer 2020 offering of EC3084. As we discussed last time, this class on signals and systems is an extension of an earlier class called 2026, Introduction to Signal Processing. 3084 will mostly discuss concepts in a continuous time context, extending ideas that were already presented in 2026 in a discrete time context with relations drawn between them. In 2026, we introduced the ideas of the unit step function and the unit impulse function. And to draw this, we use the symbol UN and the symbol delta N for the impulse. And in 30 84, I will shock you with the radically different notation of writing this with a U with a T and a delta with a T using parentheses instead of square brackets. Not all textbooks do this, but the 2026 books like to use the square brackets to indicate a discrete time system, whereas it would use parentheses for continuous time uh, signals, which is more traditional. Okay, so let's start with the unit step function. So as a review of the idea from 2026 about the discrete time signal, we defined the unit step as a function that was 0 for n less than or equal to 0. And then at 0, let's put a minus 1, a minus 2 here. We'll put a 1 here and a 2 here, etc. And then at 0, it suddenly turns on. So we'll say that it's 0 for n less than 0. And then we'll say it's 1 for in bigger than or equal to zero. And this was useful for functions that turn on at a particular point. So for instance, we would often write things like x of n is equal to sine, say, 0 0.2 pi n. Whereas if we don't have a u in here, then this is a sinusoid for all time. But putting a u in here indicates a sinusoid that starts at a particular point. If you want to indicate that you have something that starts at a particular point and then ends at a particular point, you could do something like this. So let's say we've got 0, 1, 2, and we've got a 3, 4, 5 here. And we want to indicate a function that starts at 1 and ends at 5. The way we would typically write this kind of function would be to say, OK, let's define a new x of n. I'll write u of n minus 1, because if I put the minus 1 here, that is like taking this function and shifting it right by 1. So this is going to create a function that starts at 1, a unit step function that starts at 1. But this one is going to keep going forever. So what we want to subtract from it is a function that starts at 5. Uh, let me actually redraw this. What I'll do is I'll, I'll erase this here. All right, so let me actually redraw this. So I'm going to draw this u function here as starting at 1. And I have unit step here. Do, 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 do. And this is going to keep going, right? Because there's nothing here to shut it off. So there's also a 1 at 6, 7, and 8. So what I'm going to subtract from it is another unit step function. I'm going to try to line these up. Adobe Sketchbook that I'm using here has facilities for drawing nice, straight, horizontal, vertical lines or whatever, but I haven't figured out how to use those yet. Anyway, so this one is going to be shifted over by 5. So I've got 5, 6, 7, 8. That's where this guy starts. 5, 6, 7, 8, 3, 4. So now when I subtract these functions, so basically what happens is this guy here will eliminate this guy. This guy here will eliminate this guy. This guy here will eliminate this guy. And in the end, I'm left with a function here that nicely starts at 1, at time equal 1. And it ends at 4. And the reason this can become confusing is notice that I've got a 5 in the formula, but the last thing I see is 4, because this 5 is where this unit step function starts and then kills that off. So I can use this to indicate things that take a particular amount of time. Now let's play another game here. 
So this is really a new example. And I'm emphasizing that because I'm going to hack this example here. What if this was a plus one? Well, if you have a plus here, that means that you're shifting the function to the left. So my ordinary unit step function would start at zero, but now I'm shifting to the left, it will start at minus one. The only change here would be that now I would have a function that starts at minus one and that goes all the way up to four and now doesn't include five. All right, so now let's talk about the unit step in continuous time. So we'll write this as u of t equal zero for t less than zero. And then it will be one, unambiguously one for t bigger than zero. And now we actually enter a little bit of controversy. What do we want to do for this other case here? What do we want to do for this other case here for t equal to zero? And different textbooks will do different things. Some textbooks will split the difference and they'll say it's one half for t equals zero. And later when we get into Fourier transforms, you can come up with, with some argument about why it should be that. Some might argue that it should be zero for t equals zero. Some might argue it should be one for t equals zero. And this is kind of what we're going to go with. So for our purposes, we're going to go ahead and say, hey, forget all this, forget all this. We'll have it be one for t bigger than equal to zero. This gives us a lot of notational convenience later. But I want you to know that what exactly is happening at t equals zero, this should be a source of great consternation and mystery. If you have questions that you're trying to answer that involve a solid answer to what is this at t equals zero, you're on very shaky ground. This is a mathematically strange thing. And we'll get, in, we'll get into more details later about why it's strange. Just right now, know that I'll try to avoid asking you questions where the answer to the question, what is this at t equals zero, winds up being relevant. All right, so let's do an example, somewhat analogous to a unit step example we did earlier. Let's suppose we now want to write a continuous time function that looks like this starts at one, and then it goes up to time four, and then ends like that. Notice the way I've drawn this. I now have stuff between three and four and stuff between two and three and stuff between one and two. Something to think about is when we're thinking about discrete time signals, let's say I wrote one, two, three, four, like this. Yes, later we're going to look at sampling and reconstruction. Yes, we're going to look at the ideas about recovering information that was quote unquote lost, but not really lost. But when you're thinking about a discrete time signal and doing discrete time things, there isn't any concept of information being lost between these values because there's no concept of time between these values. They're just n equal one, n equal two, n equal three all the way back to n equals minus 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, or all the way up to n equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. But there's nothing missing in between here. All right, so how we would write this? Let's write it as u of t minus 1 minus u of t minus 4. This u of t minus 1, that's a unit step function that starts at time 1 and then goes up to you know, all the way up to infinity. And then I've got another function here that is starting at time t equals four and is one going up into infinity and so on. This function being subtracted by this function. All right, so here we've got zero minus zero, zero minus zero, zero minus zero. So when we hit one, it's then gonna turn up turn on at this point, and we've got one minus zero. And then once we hit t equal four, I have one minus one, one minus one, one minus one, one minus one, and so on. Wow, that's a terrible looking graph, isn't it? Do, 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 do. Let me make the graph look a little less terrible. Something like, yeah, let's go a little straighter. I tend to just kind of write diagonally and do every which way. Let's go back to, what is this? Is this teal? I think this is teal. I now have this little function here that is on between one and four, and it's zero outside of that. 
And people often use this to represent what they'll call windows in time. So for instance, as I mentioned earlier, if I have a function like x of t here equals sine, let's say it's 880 pi t. So this is a sine wave. We'll often use cosines instead. If I divide this 880 by 2 pi, that gives me 440 hertz. So this represents the A above middle C on a piano. I will occasionally throw in musical context examples. You don't need to know anything about music for this class or anything. I just like to use them for examples. If you're not familiar with the music notation, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. So this indicates a sign. Oop. That's probably not an A, but whatever. You get the idea. Go to your piano and play an A and listen to it. But now just imagine it as a horrible sinusoid that's going on for all time, from before the Big Bang to after Gadadamarung. Now, if we want to indicate that it only happens at a certain amount of time, let me actually do this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little subscript here. Let's make this x1, and we'll call this x2. All right, so now if I write a function that's like x of 3t... <laughs> So I have a graphics tablet here, and it's kind of weird because my brain wants to look down at the tablet and see what I'm writing, but I really need to be looking at the screen. I know there's fancy, expensive ones where you can actually write on the screen. And some people use iPads and, I guess, Microsoft Surface tablets and stuff like that, but I haven't gone that route yet. All right, so I've got t minus 1 minus u of t minus 4. Now when I multiply these together, this is going to mask out all the places after 1 and 4, whatever the time units is. We're usually thinking seconds. So between 1 and 4, I will artistically draw a sine wave thingy. Obviously, there's a lot more waves in here between 1 and 4 seconds, but then it's zero out of sight of here. Another thing is this wave is probably not ex exactly matching the zero crossings here. It's probably going to cut it off at some awkward spot in the sine wave. But now I can do Morse code signals. You could go do, 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 whatever that is. But now I have a way of masking out and creating longer or short signals, whatever those might be. So something that will often trip people up when they're moving from a discrete time unit step to a continuous time unit step is what happens at the end when you're trying to indicate one of these functions that shuts off. So say I've got u of n minus u of n minus 3, and up here I've got, or down here, sorry, I have u of t minus u of t minus 3. In this case, I'll have a function that starts at t equals 0. I've got another function that starts at t equals 3, and when I subtract them, I'll get a function that starts at t equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and goes all the way up to 3, 0, 1, 2, 3 like so. When we are doing the discrete time thing here, let's plot out what that looks like. So I've got doot, 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 forever. Just as this is forever down here, and this is forever down here. I've got, I've got 0, 1, 2, 3. All right, so I have 0, 1, 2, 3. And now when I subtract something from that that starts at 3 here, doot, doot, here's 2, here's 3. Doot, 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 doot. Then, oh, let's see if I can actually move stuff down. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to grab this section. Oh, that's kind of slick. Okay, so I can move it down like that. When I subtract these two things, and this guy kills off this guy, or I should say this guy kills off that guy, I have a function here in discrete time that's going from 1 and 2. And what confuses people is looking at the endpoints. When you're doing something in the discrete time domain, this element here, this 3, that's where it's 0 again. So the 3 gives me a function that is 1 up until 2. Whereas here, there's all this stuff going on between 2 and 3, and that indeed show up. So that's a little difference between these discrete time and continuous time versions of what's fundamentally the same idea. Again, there's no concept of an n between 2 and 3 here. There, n equals 2 or n equals 3, but it's not something in between. Whereas here is I have all of this stuff. But again, we're going to really, really work hard to avoid asking questions about what's happening at the endpoints here exactly. Although it does come up, particularly when we look at the one-sided, aka unilateral Laplace transform. So if you think about that example we just did, 
x of t is equal to u of t minus u of t minus 3. There's nothing magical about the fact that this was an integer here. We're now in continuous time. These time points that we're shifting to can be whatever. So if I wanted to indicate a function that, say, went between, oh, this is kind of terrible, say, went between minus 1.5 all the way up to say, say maybe there's a point here that's like 3.75. This is terribly drawn, but you get the idea. So I've got a function that's going kind of like this. Well, I can go ahead and write that. I'll have a new function. Uh, maybe we'll call this one and this one too. Quite often I'll make a series of functions all called x that are meant to be different things when I'm just improvising examples like this. So here I have t plus 1.5, right, because this is to the left of 0. And then I'll have minus u of t minus 3.75, like so. Okay, so most of the functions we've been looking at so far are not terribly interesting. Let's try doing something that's marginally more interesting. So let's say we wanted to make something like a pyramid kind of shape that went from 0 up to 2 and then drifted back down with, say, the same slope. So here we might use something like a ramp function. So what I'll do is I'll write x of t is equal to t ut. So by itself, this ramp function will be 0 up till 0. And then once it hits t equals 0, it will start sloping up with a slope of 1. All right, so that will get us this part of the function. And we now need to go back down the other direction. Now, you might be tempted to do this. And this is not the thing you want to do. So I'm going to use red as the bad color. This is the color we do not speak of. What movie was that? Was that The Village? What we want to do is we want to have something that's going back down the other direction. So you might say, well, let me subtract now. This shifted a bit. So what I'll do is, instead of u of t minus 2, I'll need to shift everything. So I'll write, no, this doesn't actually work. Ah, let me emphasize that. I'm just showing you what's going to go wrong with this bad color. All right, so I've got t minus 2, u of t minus 2. So what would this do? Well, this will have a slope going down with a slope of minus 1 that starts at 2, and it's going to be 0 up until that part. But notice, this doesn't quite do what I want, because here it's sloping up with a slope of 1, and certainly this is going to slope down with a slope of 1. But when I add these together, if we think about what's happening here, if I were to superimpose that there, this cancels out the sloping action, but it's already gotten up to 2 at that point. So this strategy doesn't do what I want. It winds up doing something like this. And so that is so problematic, I'm going to see how much I can use my undo feature. Undo, 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 do, 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 undoing. We're hitting control Z to see how far back the uh, control Z. Ah, oh, look at that. Yeah. Oh, we undoed all the evil. And now we are saved. All right. So what am I going to do here? Now, I'm actually going to subtract twice that. Because now I'll have basically minus one blah, blah, blah that gives me that original, you know, it cancels out the slope. But then I'll have another one here to actually get the slope going the other direction. But I'm not quite done yet. This approach will have me going down this direction ad infinitum. That's not something I want to do. So let me control Z that. We need something to happen at four. Well, it's going down this direction. And I might say, oh, well, let's just add... 2, t minus 2, but no, that's not going to be what we want because we don't want it to start sloping back upward again. That's not something we want. I'm really getting excited about using the control Z here as a narrative structure. All right, it's going down this direction. I want to add a ramp going up to cancel that ramp that's going down. So I'll have a, another ramp function here that this time 
starts at t equal four, and it's gonna go do to do up here with slope of one. And now what that's gonna do is it will cancel the slope that's going down this way, it will cancel it out. So that will indeed give me the straight line I want at that point. That's how you make a little pyramid. Suppose for a second we wanted to do a different example. So I'm gonna say different. Here's a different example. What if we don't want a two up here? What if we actually want this to be a one? Well, then I would just divide everything here by two. So this would turn into a half. I would have a half down here. And the two here, I would scratch that out. Okay, now that I've spent nearly 20 minutes blabbing about the unit step function, let's talk about what we can expect to see next time. Unsurprisingly, because I mentioned the delta function at the beginning of the lecture, that's going to be what we're going to talk about. And this is a very weird, bizarre thing in the continuous time domain. It's called the Dirac delta function, and it does some weird thing. So that's going to be all kinds of fun. So I'll see you next time.